Hey, I'm Brian Beethoff, writer, creator, and producer of Emmy Award-winning zombie comedy, Acting Dead, and you are watching FaceTime with Todd Warden. Locked up With our feelings like we're boxed up Every minute seems so f***ed up Find our way out of this problem, problem When all of the light fades into the night All the simple things will make us feel people. We'll be right back with award-winning film, TV, and voice actor, Brian Beacock. So welcome back to the show, everyone. So my guest today is a film, TV, and voice actor. He's got an award-winning show called Acting Dead, and he also created the show called McCracken Live. But you know what? Let's take a look at a clip. Everybody, I'm Brian Beacock, voice actor. I've done such voices as Gilman, I did not wet the bed. It's punishment time. <laughs> Hey boss, come on, I want some eggs! If you weren't so beautiful, I would have killed you with my Fuji Kujaku. I'm Bokemon, the keeper of the book. Oh, bugs, why did it have to be bugs? Are you an actor? You're not booking! I think I just haven't found the right material. You kind of have that desperate vibe, you know? Maybe acting is just not your thing. Uh... I'm really looking for something a lot more authentic than that. I should die. Congratulations on choosing Flatline Inc. Getting actors work even if it kills them. It's only going to hurt a little, but forever. Has anyone done it before? Yes, Justin Bieber's a client. And then successfully? Uh, then no. Please welcome to the show, Brian Beacock. Hey, hey, it's Beacock. Is it Peacock? Did it's, I it's, B it's Beacock with a B. I think I said B. You know what it is? It's my Brooklyn accent. So right, hey Peacock. Yeah, I hey, like it. Peacock, how you doing with the feathers? You know what I'm hey man, I've I've heard many things my whole life, so it's all good. <laughs> Whoa! Pause. I <laughs> how are you? I'm great, man. How are awesome. You? I'm really good. I'm really good. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, um. It's kind of weird. I'm I'm in nighttime right now. You're in the daytime, but it, it looks like we're both in New York City. What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just uh, it could have been a green screen backup. It it could have been gray or black. I decided with some. I think it's a generic city. I'm not sure what it is. I haven't looked at yeah. not looked at enough, but it's pretty yeah. cool. I love it, Brian. First of all, I checked out a lot of your stuff, and uh, I was laughing my ass off. And you know, I'm a oh. comedic person, so I love seeing people that really make people laugh because right now the way the world is your type of comedy i think it's what's needed right now to be honest oh, with thank you. you yeah of course and let's jump right into it and before we do that i want to thank anthony turk and patrika darbo for setting this interview up two great people and yeah. uh they know i have fun with a lot of these a lot of my interviewees that come on so when they told me about you i'm like yeah it's a win-win let's do this <laughs> So, awesome. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, yeah, they're incredible. So speaking about Patrika, let's talk about and dive right into The Acting Dead. Um, this is obviously a show. It's a satirical, I can't even talk right now, satirical, satirical, right? Satirical, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Comedy, which actually won you guys an Emmy. Um, yeah. Tell me about the show, because I watched a number of episodes and I thought it was great. Tell us about it. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a um, it's a traditional half hour sitcom, but it's a short form comedy. So it's, you know, eight minutes. Eight minutes is our half hour. Um, started as a, a, a web series you know, kind of thing. And it's it's this hyper realized Los Angeles where everything is zombies, yeah. which um, which is still kind of that way. But it was definitely that way a couple of years ago. Every commercial was zombie, you know, Walking Dead and and um, all kinds of uh, BBC shows. Everything was zombies. So in this world, um, actors are cast as as zombies in TV and movies. But I play a character named Tate Blodgett, who is pretty untalented. He's not a great actor. And so he can't even get cast as a zombie. So he goes to this company 
uh, called uh, Flatline Inc., where they turn real actors into actual zombies, so they're more easily and readily cast as zombies. And even then, he has he has trouble, you know, uh, getting a job. And Patrika Darbo uh, plays my agent, Margot Mullen, and she used to be a travel agent, and she just scratched out one word on her little nameplate on her desk and put talent. So now she's a talent agent. Uh, but she was so funny. I I had known Patrika. I did another web series with her, a couple of them actually, uh, years prior in the web series world um, through a producer, Susan Bernhardt, um, who's also a producer on Acting Dead. And uh, we just knew that we wanted to have her. And she was just, Patrika is always willing to do anything. Just crazy, weird, wild hair, wild costumes, whatever. So um, long story short, the show, uh, we did about eight or 10 episodes and had a bunch of TV stars, a bunch of soap stars. Um, Debbie Gibson, the, the pop singer, she's in it. She plays a diner waitress, terrible diner waitress. And the year that we finished, the Emmys uh, opened up their categories to short form, uh, short form video awards, you know, categories. And so we entered and Patrika got nominated. And what do you know? She won. So it was the first time they ever had a best actress in a comedy or drama for drama for short form win. And it was Patrika. So it was so exciting. So exciting. Yeah. I mean, I got to take my mom to the Emmys. That was really cool. And I mean, that's it, right. You know, that's, that's, that's the pinnacle of success as far as I'm concerned. So and I like how you said you brought your mom because oh, your, yeah. your parents are one of the people that anytime something good happens in your life, they're one of the first people that you call. And for sure. Wouldn't it be horrible if you get to go to the Emmys and they're the last person you call the go? <laughs> I know. It's like, you know, it's oh, guess what? And by the way, guess what? Watch me on TV. It's going to be like, what? <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, it was such an easy decision to, to bring my mom. But also, you know, she's she, at the time, I guess she was, I don't know, 80, maybe 85 or 86. And so I was just worried about how difficult it would be for her walking the red carpet and wearing the shoes and all that stuff. But she was like, no, I'm going to do it. She was fully done up, made up high heels. And it would have been one thing just to go to the Emmys and, and do the red carpet and all that stuff. But the fact that Patrika won and we went to the after party and my mom got to meet all these celebrities, like it was, it was just a perfect, a perfect night. Oh, of course. And the writing of it is, is great. I have to thank ask, you. I'm sure somebody asked you about this before, but my audience will love how did you even come up with the idea of killing yourself, becoming a zombie to go into a zombie movie? Because it pretty much is like, you know what? In order for actors to really, really get a role, you have to be dead and suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the way my brain works, that's just a typical Wednesday. But um, no, I just I just kind of thought that um, I was stuck on the 405 on the on the freeway in traffic. And I was looking around at all the people, at, at, you know, just sitting there stuck. And I thought we're all we're, we're all just behaving like zombies, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if we really were? And yet. What if we were zombies, but we still had to do all the regular things like go to the gym and pay taxes and go on dates and, and go to auditions? I thought, well, this would be cool. You know, actors, uh, zombie actors going to audition to play zombies. So it kind of it kind of started from that. And then the style of the show is kind of um, Shaun of the Dead meets The Office. Yeah. So it's a lot of camera pushes and dead air and. The music is very Arrested Development mm -hmm. style. Um, great composer on it, uh, yeah. Jamie Forsyth, who worked on Medium and um, uh, Twenty Four and stuff. He's a, he's a buddy of mine. He did all the music. Uh, so it's it's an odd show. It's definitely an odd show. It's it's not particularly scary or bloody. It has its moments, mm -hmm. but it's just a very kind of like dry, bizarre comment on on Hollywood. Yeah, and I love yeah I. I'm gonna I'm gonna literally finish watching the whole thing because it was just the it's so great to see writing, but also good acting at the same Thank time. You. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, they're getting more and more today, but you know, it's those kind of like movies back in the day where you had an Ocean's Eleven where the writing was incredible, right? Actually, I'm sorry, let's reverse that. The writing was bad, the acting <laughs> was incredible, but then they redid it, I believe, 10 years ago, 15 years ago great writing but great actors and it's just great to see good writing and good acting at the same time Think i know now when you're talking about oceans 11 are you talking about the original yeah because uh, nice 
I have to say that because I'm a big movie TV head and yeah, a lot of people agree that back in the day, Ocean's Eleven had a great cast and that's the only reason. Oh, yeah. Well, but the writing wasn't that great. So I think somebody saw it and redid it with your type of comedy. Not only is it great writing, there's such camaraderie between the cast as you guys yeah. work together and you're all funny. Like every thank guy, you, orderly who was in the original, you know, flatline where he got killed by you. He was your first, <laughs> you know, to your agent to the, the the producers of the show and everything else. You guys just really had a great camaraderie. Were you guys like that off and on the screen at the same time? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the people I knew from Universal, uh, Eric Martsoff, who's a big soap star, I think he's actually won an Emmy as well. Right. Um, he used to work at Universal with me. That's how I know him, Universal Studios. Um, Peter Vogt, uh, who, who plays one of the characters in the show, he's insane. And then Carolyn Hennessy from General Hospital and a million other things. Mm -hmm. She was in the soap world. And uh, Jillian Clare, I knew from a hundred years ago, actually, she and I, she was Cindy Lou Who and I was the Grinch at Universal about 25 years ago. Nice. Um, that's not how we reconnected. We reconnected through the, uh, the web series world and then talked about how we both worked at Universal. We're like, what? We know each other. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, with comics and, and a lot of us do stand up, we're just crazy, weird, fun people, you know, but uh, I was really, really lucky and pleased to get so many like heavy hitters, John J. York, another soap star. Um, yeah. Uh, Chris Gallia from Disney's uh, uh, Jesse. He was hysterical. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, it was really a, a, a great time. And then all our background people, we had about gosh, I don't know, 50 or 60 backgrounds. So we, our crew was probably 100 people, which is pretty big for a little small independent uh, TV thing, you know, completely like self-funded, no studios behind us, you know, no YouTube, nothing like that. It was just us. No, and it's great. And I recommend anybody who's watching this interview, definitely go see Acting Dead. You can definitely see all the episodes on YouTube. Uh, yes. Great. Um, awesome. Now, going a little backwards, you had a first series that you created uh, with your co-star that's actually in The Acting Dead as well. Um, what was it? McCracken Live. McCracken right? Live. Yeah. John Yelvington. Yeah. Um, and actually, Paul, Paul, Paul Nigro actually is in that show as well. Yeah. Yeah. I McCracken love Live. Yeah, I got it. Did you check it out? Have you know anything about it? Have you seen I it? I did. I did. What I loved about it. <laughs> I have to, man. One of the great things about being a talk show is I get to see all this great stuff from yeah. and McCracken Live. And the funny thing is, I was actually thinking it before somebody said it in the show. It's pretty much a drag queen meets Tim Allen. You know, kind of like yes. it, where it's like it's not the it's not a home improvement show. However, there is stuff yeah. like that, but it, it's a great take on being a drag queen. But always things go wrong. And even a producer of that show, like, let's just run with it. Let's I'm yes. person to crash and burn. And, <laughs> and when you came out, I'm like, damn, he's cute. <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, oh, I got to get that. I got to get that McCracken, McCracken body back. Yeah, I was, man, I was pulled so tight and so taut for that show. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, I came up with that because I was doing a bunch of auditions for sketch comedy and stuff, uh, Mad TV and things like that. And that was one of the characters that I had created. And uh, John Yelvington and I co-wrote that show. And we thought, what if it's like Tootsie meets Home Improvement kind of in the style of 30 Rock or Mary Tyler Moore show. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like that. It's very bright. It's very exciting. And, and yes, yeah, this poor guy, uh, um, Tyler, and he's just, he's stuck in this world where he, he really wants to be a good uh, home improvement guy. He wants to be Tim Allen. You know what I mean? But uh, circumstances led to him having to do this show in drag. And so he's kind of stuck in this world where he's becoming enormously famous as this as this character, Carol Ann McCracken. And people don't e I mean, people know he's in drag, but he's not known as himself at all. And that's what he always wanted. So he's kind of like living this this double life. We have so much more. Uh, to film for that show. But again, it's always money. It's always money. We've got another season for acting dead. And we just we need to get the cash. But yeah. I love McCracken Live. Yeah. McCracken Live, I, I could see you having more fun on it because yeah. it's um it's incredible. It's tasteful, first of all. But yeah. there's so much of a comedic margin that you can go for. 
Uh, and, yeah. it's, and you know why it's going to relate so well. Right now, the LGBTQ, I believe I missed one more letter, um, is one of the biggest communities on the planet. And the way you have the show, it's very le- relatable. It's not yeah. just a drag queen host, but you actually go into the personal life where one of the yeah. things that I think would affect a lot of people is what you were sitting with your attorney. And she and the lady's like, yeah, I married a gay man and had a kid with him. And they're signing the divorce papers. And you know that happens on a daily basis. And yeah. Really yeah, I think, the, I think the attorney goes, oh, if yeah. I had a dime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So even though they're sensitive subjects, they're real subjects that I think people can relate to. And that's why a lot of great shows last a long time. Yeah. Like a Seinfeld, like Seinfeld, had every little thing that we go through, but they brought it out into comedy. And I yep. think something like that. I think it's wonderful what you guys created. Thank you. Yeah, that was really that was uh, uh, we shot really quickly on that show. Um, it, it, it was actually done initially, probably what you saw was the pilot presentations about eight or nine minutes long, yeah. uh, kind of like a sizzle reel. And we did that to pitch it as a TV show. And then from that, people saw it and they said, you really need to expand on this and make little mini episodes. It was early web series world with new technology. And mm-hmm. so that's where that started. We won uh, LA Web Fest years ago and we got to go to Marseille, France uh, to to show in one of Europe's first ever web series festivals, which was really exciting. All paid expense uh, trip to France. And uh, it, it was, it was amazing. It was a really cool time. Really cool time. I love it. I would, I'm really hoping to see one of these shows get to the big boys as one of these. Yeah. And uh, I, you know what it is? We all know at the end of the day, it, it's about being in the wrong place at the right time. You know, uh, and it's true. It's, it's and it's it's money and it's name and it's connections and it's really an interesting thing when you're a, when you're an independent producer and you're trying to like you know get it past the gatekeepers the secretaries the mini producers whatever um, along the way as you're trying to get it to the executive producer or the showrunner or whatever you have all these people that want to help you but each person wants a piece of the pie so by the time you get to the front desk you've got nothing to offer you know you've promised away your show. So it's really difficult. You really have to know the right people to be able to get in the door and go right to the head of the class to at least pitch it and have something to, to offer them, you know, on the back end. Yeah, and I, and I think you could probably get to that door. I mean, you, you mentioned in the early in the interview that you felt lucky about all these great people coming to you. But I've always noticed that great people go to great people in Hollywood because they see talent and uh, – <laughs> They want to be involved with new town or up and coming. I mean, you're seasoned anyway, but newer ideas sometimes yeah. what blows up. And a lot of great actors start noticing that now and directors. And I think you have that shot. Um, plus, you're thank a, you. You're natural, by the way, as an actor. No, thank you. Yeah, you can. See <laughs> and you have a lot of fun. The best job in the world is not only passionate, but you're having fun and looking forward to doing it. I think you look forward to going to set um, every very, day. very true. It, although not although and um it was terrifying i mean here i was executive producer writer and acting in this show this is acting dead and it was a lot of responsibility you know because and i had great producers and great co-producers paul nigro and susan bernhardt etc but um ultimately it all came down to me and so uh it was stressful you know what i mean i i don't think it'll be as stressful next time but first time out it was it was a nail biter for yeah. sure. Yeah, once you so, get into the ground, it's like, yeah, let's take off, let's do this, and then your wheels start spinning on great ideas, great writing. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you have had a long career so far, and one of your things <laughs> you know for is, well, I'm saying I think we're the same age, so I'm going to say long career so far because we, yeah, 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 years ago, right? Like, don't get it twisted, everybody. We like 25 <laughs> years old. Just to let you. That's know. right. Thank you. The salt and pepper thing is back, so we're just letting people know. But I do this on purpose. We are as voiceover. Um, yeah. Um, you did a lot. I believe some of these cartoons you did, they were like Japanese based, correct? Um, yeah, I, I do. I do mainly uh, Japanese anime that then gets translated into English, comes to the U.S., and then we redub it. You know, matching the flaps and stuff like lip syncing. Mm-hmm. Um, I and I started twenty years ago in a show called Digimon. I was in season three of Digimon, Digimon Tamers. I played Takato. 
Oh. And uh, that show literally started my career. Like from, I got three seasons of Digimon, all different characters. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to Naruto and Bleach and uh, Code Geass and Dararara. And, um, it's, it really, it's been great. And, and it's continues. I have a new show that I'm doing next week and, uh, you know, video games and stuff like that. And then things get re-released. I did a video game called Danganronpa where I play a, a sadistic panda bear or a black and white bear called Monokuma. And uh, that just got like a 20 year or, or a 10 year re-release. And so the fandom just went crazy. And I started a TikTok channel and I have all these little paper cutouts of all my characters that I voice. And it's so weird. My life is so strange. Um, and just when I think I know exactly the way it's going to go, it completely does like a, a 180 and, and I have a whole new thing happening. Yeah, it's uh, lightning strikes. Uh, when I had a meeting, yeah. uh, I had a quick meeting with the VP of Damien at uh, Times Square Alliance, and he pretty much said, Todd, you could be working five, ten years, working hard, doing the game, but once that lightning strikes, yeah. your life is never going to be the same. Things just take off really quick, and you're trying to yeah. figure out, where were all these people for the past 10 years? And <laughs> I know. That's all it is. It takes that one. You could do amazing work for years. You could work with Oscar winners. You could work with this. But it's that one thing that all industries appreciate, which takes yeah. like an entire career. And um, as a voice actor, I'm loving interviewing voice actors now. I had the honor of interviewing Rob Paulson. Recently. Yeah. And uh, last week, I did uh, uh, Bob Bergen. Uh, Bob. So He's how amazing. do you feel that you're in that realm of these legendary people because you're on that level right there right now? Well, I mean, it's funny because there are different levels. So there's original animation, the people that do, you know, American Dad and The Simpsons. That's original animation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's commercial voiceover, which is different. And then mine, which is uh, anime, which definitely has its own niche and, and core group of people. Right. So... Um, and everything, of course, is in relation to pay rates and all that stuff, too. So original animation, commercials, those are the, those are the big ones. So that's where I want to get. I've done some over the course of my years, but my niche and where I kind of live is, a, is in that anime thing. But it's fine. It's great. Um, but it's exciting, you know, that, that people know me. My TikTok really surprised me. Uh, kind of took off really quick. And all these people uh, that knew that I did say they knew I did Monokuma, but they didn't know that I also did Takato or they didn't know that I knew did Yumachika or Octagawa. So, you know, cause the, the credits at the end of an anime, you know, they're not, it's not a, yeah, especially now, you know, Hulu it's like, Netflix, what is that? See, exactly. Balls and yeah. gotta in the screen be like, I, know <laughs> yes. I, know, I got a flash, take a picture and send this to my mom. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. Back in the day when I was doing Digimon on Fox kids, you know, it was, it was like full cards, you mm -hmm. know, starring Brian Bika, whatever. Um, so it's funny. You're right. Like now all these people are like, Oh my gosh, that's you. Or, you know, hundreds and thousands of people, whatever, 60,000, whatever, uh, discovering me. It's kind of fun, but you're, you're exactly right. You're like, well, where have you been? Cause I've been right here. Yeah. And you know why that happens? Um, I talked to a number of my guests and I'll say to you as well, the social media world is amazing now, especially for people that are behind the scenes because it's allowing you to be seen face yeah. well so people can recognize you. So if you're out in the town, oh my God, it's Brian. Let me get an autograph like a football player. You have to tell me on the because <laughs> like, they're wearing a mask over their face, right? Yeah. Like today, which really stinks, unless you're in the front of the screen and the head actors or actresses, the credits go by fast because, first of all, people are looking forward to the bloopers in the end because that's what they want to see. <laughs> and because the, the cast and crew today is not just 100, it's thousands. It's thousands. Nobody's going to sit there and watch credits of the people that really made this, even though it's bad. You know, you, you, you need key grips. You need sound guys. You need FX. But unfortunately, people don't, unless they're in the industry, don't care. And I think TikTok Instagram um, is a breath of fresh air for the behind the scenes crew because it allows you to promote what's not being promoted correctly. It's true. And, and it's funny you say that. So it, it's really opened up my world to uh, cosplay artists, you know, the, the, the anime cosplay okay. convention folk, um, regular artists, cookie art and cake art. I watch those videos constantly. That's how I fall asleep. 
Um, but cinematographers and painters and all that stuff that didn't have an outlet before, you know, they were lucky if they would get a show or maybe they could be in a magazine or maybe they'd have their own website, which was very expensive. But now I'm seeing all this talent from all over the world on social media. So that's really cool. That's, that's the good part of social media. There's plenty of bad, there's plenty of, you know, haters and all that nonsense, but uh, I pretty much stay away from that on my, on my channels. Yeah. Delete, blocked. You want to know something? I get a lot of the stuff on my things too, and I don't even block or delete them. I allow them there because. Do you? Well, keep it this way. If somebody makes a bad comment, you always got to get bad comments, right? Oprah yeah, said, true. if you're not ready for the negative comments, you're not ready to be successful. Yeah. A straight up truth. But however, think of it this way somebody makes a comment on their feed, that person who made a comment, their friends most likely are going to see that post because they made a comment. Yeah. So that negative comment can give you positive press, right? Yeah. By more people seeing it. So, and at the end of the day, if somebody really wants to make a negative comment, just think about, all right, so what are you doing with your life that you took your time? To <laughs> yeah. You don't even know me. It's yeah. Like, so I just ignore it and uh, I laugh at it. And uh, I'm pretty much like, hey, thanks, bro. Appreciate you. Uh, stopping by and i'm sure I'm yeah yeah in the next video so i do that too i'm usually like well thanks for the follow or thanks for the i usually i they they don't understand it but i usually you know say thanks for the compliment or whatever I'm like i didn't compliment you and then i just you know let it go or whatever but um but i you know i i don't really care i got plenty of people oh. that support me so I, oh. I i play around for a little bit if it's hurtful or dangerous or hateful to others whatever i'll remove it because i don't want that kind of action but sure. if they're saying that something i did was was crap or whatever that's fine i mean yeah. you're not you're not the first you won't be the last yeah and like in the beginning of this interview i couldn't even say the word satristical i can't say it again <laughs> And I just did that on purpose. By, I just did it on purpose, by the way. So I'm like, yeah, I want somebody to comment that I can't speak. He right? couldn't even say satirical, dude. Oh my God. Holy cow! Yeah. <laughs> easier word for you. Go back to Uri Oh my God. God. Promo. I can use it. <laughs> you know, that's just the way people are. Um, yeah. The other thing was, you did a lot of different stuff besides voice acting, uh, writing. Uh, you were actually a rehearsal actor. Um, in a lot of great yeah. things, American Idol, Oscars. Explain to people what a rehearsal actor is, because the world of acting knows, but the people that don't. Explain what you did and some of the great things you did behind that. Yeah, so a lot of people, and I didn't know this till maybe five years ago, but a lot of people confuse like a rehearsal actor with a stand-in with an extra or a background actor. We don't use the word extra. So um, a rehearsal actor is someone comes into any kind of TV show uh, typically a talk show, a game show, award show, <clears throat> variety show, mm -hmm. and all the, the cast, not the cast, the crew, the director, the teleprompter people, the cameramen, they all have to rehearse that show before they film it or tape it, right? So they need to know how long this line takes or how the lighting looks on someone who's 5'10 with blonde hair, blah, blah, blah. So we come in and we run the whole show. Uh, for teleprompter, for timing, for sometimes for costume changes, for comedic gags. Uh, and it tells the cameraman where to aim the camera. So for the Oscars, that's a tough gig. That's a tough one. So we go in and we get a script. It's a whole show and we have assignments. So I'm going to be Bruce Willis. I'm going to be whatever, you know, Steve McQueen. Isn't he dead? Um, I'm going to be Tom Holland, whatever. So for this assignment, I have to go up on stage and I have to give the announcement for Best Actor Award. So I read the teleprompter. Mm -hmm. For the next assignment, I run out to the seat and I find Chair 45 and I have to be Tom Cruise, who might win for Best Actor, right? So all the cameras are posted on all of us. And whoever wins, because it's different every run through of the show all week for seven days, mm -hmm. whoever wins goes up on stage and does an improv of an acceptance speech. So you have to make stuff up. So we're all researching like, okay, what was the movie about? Uh, who else did, who was in the movie with Tom Cruise? Uh, you know, who's his wife? Who's his, who's his agent? All that stuff. So the camera people can um, uh, cut to the people in the audience. It's a lot of work and it's really stressful. Um, so that's that. And then for American Idol, I've been fortunate enough to be the stand-in uh, rehearsal actor for Luke Bryan, who's one of the judges, right? Yeah. So I sit at that desk where Luke and Katie and Lionel sit and we just watch people sing all week and we give critiques. It's always got to be positive, obviously. You know, that sucks. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be positive. Um, 
And also, it's funny, it's got to be positive, but it also can't be too specific. Because imagine you're the, the singer, right? The contestant, the real contestant. And you have this rehearsal actor saying, I really like your vibrato, or I really like the way you held that long note. Right. And they're going to get that in their head. What if they decide to change it? You know, like you can't, you can't navigate their performance. It's just yeah. going to be great job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we do that all week and then Luke, Lionel and Katie come in and that's the first time they've ever seen the show is in front of the audience. But I do a full rehearsal with Ryan Seacrest, uh, all improv and teleprompter and it's a great job. This will be my fifth or sixth season, however long Luke has been there. And I do that. Um, I've done the red carpet. I was Ryan Seacrest for the red carpet for the Oscars. So I read all of Ryan's teleprompter I stuff. Uh, Really fun, stressful too, because all his teleprompter stuff is like, and now back to so and so. Yes. But for interviewing the fake stars, you know, here's whatever uh, Angelica Houston, whatever, uh, isn't she dead? No, um, you have to. I know she's not. You have to make <laughs> stuff up, you know, and you've got someone in your ear saying, "Ask about her previous Oscar win," or "How's her new baby?" You know, it's crazy. So it's a really, really tough job. Um, but it's really fun. It's really, really fun. And I've, I've seen so many things. I was there when the whole set collapsed on Jimmy Kimmel. Do you oh, remember that for the Oscars a couple yeah. of years ago? Yeah. Someone, someone pressed the wrong button on the set and the DeLorean went down into the stage and then the whole set collapsed inside and he had just walked down the stairs and had left the stage and everything fell, the curtain, everything was crazy. Can you imagine the press and lawsuits that would have happened if he got even touched? It, it I just don't know how it didn't happen because it was literally like 30 seconds between him walking down the stairs and the set collapsing. And of course everyone's watching, like no one better have their camera out. And 15 minutes later it was on TMZ. Of course, so, you always get that one or two person. Oh yeah. I mean, people don't understand there are people that have such technology today. They don't have that many cameras on them, but a button could be a camera and they just, <laughs> in their, their glasses. And I'm glad you mentioned Ryan. I got the, I really got the honor of meeting. Um, we didn't even exchange hellos or anything, but I was one of the commentators that covered New Year's this year in Times Square. Nice. Yeah, and it was an honor, and there's something going on with next year, so I can't say anything at this point. But watching Ryan uh, work, um, yep. I don't think people realize how hard of a worker he is. He's got like five shows, and you mentioned it. It's the little lines – Boom, boom, boom. And you got to be on point 24-7 yep. in New York because that's what I was doing that night. And it relates to what you do as well as an actor because you have to be on point at a certain yeah. point. Not, not sound critique, but you have to be on point at a certain point. And you're seeing what these jobs really entail. Like you're an actor. You studied to be an actor, right? Yeah. You learned it. It's your profession. But now you're learning other jobs. For sure. And being a talk show host or a commentator, you yeah. have to, your job as an actor to know your role, right? As a commentator of a show, you have to hold down a six hour show. No false. So that's why right. these hosts are very rare. I think you have it in you. Ah, oh, thank you. I had a thing for your resume to do it because I believe you're that talented. I could see you being a host to, let's say, a Comic Con. I love to do it. I, I, I had a friend who actually did a satellite, uh, a small satellite out in uh, New York for New Year's, and she loved that. And I've had friends that have done all the like the car shows in Vegas where they have a teleprompter where they're listening to their script and they're just parroting it back, you know, like a second after they hear it. That's really tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's funny. I had never done the teleprompters before or the cue cards or the in-ear monitor or anything like that uh, until I did the Golden Globes a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I just like fell into it. Like it was, it was difficult and I had a lot to learn, but I wasn't afraid of it at all. Right. So um, I really enjoy it. So thank you for saying that. And as far as Ryan goes, man, so he flies in, I don't, I don't know his schedule, but he basically flies in, does the rehearsal, does the show that's live on TV and then flies back to New York. Yeah. Like his week is crazy. He did a, a Facebook or an Instagram live not too long ago yeah. and talked about basically how he, how he gets through it. You know, it's, it's exercise, good food, early to bed um, habits. You know what I mean? And he's been doing it for a long time too, but um, it, it's, it's just amazing. And he is, he's just with it. Like he shows up and he knows what he's doing. And yet, 
he's very, very relaxed and comfortable. There's no tension. There's no um, bizarre energy. He's completely like, hey, guys, let's just have a good day, yeah. which I think is a whole nother skill. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's hard to do that. It's hard to manage a set that way when the, the stakes are so high. Yes. And you hit it on the nose. How many artists out there in the world are so confident in their abilities that you'll never know if they're freaking out? They're just, right. They're just that's right. Talented. Like, that's why you have a Denzel Washington, right? Yeah. Or uh, Jack Nicholson. They're solid when they hit. Yeah. The you know, you as a voice actor with all the things that you do, I feel that you're solid when you hit the set. The people around you have to rely on you to be the lead and they follow that, you know, um, mojo, uh, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. An easy guy to work with. He's making me easier. And I think a lot of great people understand that. I think you understand that too. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, another skill that I do have that I know I have is that if I don't know what I'm doing, I know how to, (laughs) I know how to fake it. (laughs) <laughs> and I've, I've had that skill for a long time and it really allows you to get through some sticky situations and watch and learn until you actually do know what you're doing yeah. uh, without ever letting your guard down and being seen for, uh, you know, being a little, a little tense. Yeah. So I guess your future job is going to be set to education 101. So I'm going to teach you guys how to do things that you don't know how to do, but fake it <laughs> like you make it. <laughs> it's my life. That's my life. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you have a, a, just a lot of stuff going on. Are there some things coming up that we don't know about that you can talk about uh, that you're mm-hmm. working on at the moment that does not have an NDA behind it? Uh, gosh, let's see. Um, I think there might be. There's a show on. I don't even know what the shows are on anymore. Hold on, I got something on my screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm on a TV show called uh, Boruto, which is a, a spinoff of Naruto. Mm-hmm. And I'm still recording stuff for that. Um, but honestly, I don't even know if it's on Hulu or Netflix or whatever. I just had a, um, a movie, two movies come out on Netflix called Stand By Me, Doraemon, okay. um, which is basically like um, Japan's Mickey Mouse. It's this robot cat. Every, people will know who Doraemon is or they won't. Oh. Um, there's, I have like three shows coming out that do have NDAs, so I can't talk about those. Um, I'm doing conventions. I'm going to London in a week. I'm very excited about that. It's my gosh, second time to London in six months for a, for a Comic-Con. Yeah. Really excited. Yeah. And then I'm going to Chicago a couple times and Indiana and for, for conventions. And then just uh, you know working on auditions and trying to get money for Acting Dead. And uh, I'm supposed to be taking Caroline McCracken on a cruise ship. So I've got to, number one, lose weight to fit into the dresses oh. and then <laughs> and then write the show but um i've had this open open invitation for a cruise ship for a long time so i'm working on that that's uh that's pretty cool it reminds me of that uh cuba gooding jr movie where he enters on a ship and he ends up being like a, I think it was a drag queen but he ends up falling in love at the same time that's right was it called gay cruise or something like no, that or my my friend trip. eddie driscoll was, was in it i don't know if it was boat trip or something like boat that. trip is it's not it? a great movie it's not a great movie it's just hilarious just the writing <laughs> of it it's like all right so a straight guy goes on a cruise becomes a drag queen yeah. in love and blah 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 there's a little different take but i think right yeah. now where we are in society um acceptance is a huge thing today and i think that wow. alone would bring some comedic atmosphere to yeah. a negative area that we're going through right now if, you know if you would the way i just said it is i think we need more people like you to come out of the war works and make people laugh more and make people thank you where you are where they could find you and speaking of where they could find you what is the best place that you want people to find you follow you or just even look you up um, become a follower of yours. Awesome. So kind of kind of normal, but also kind of strange uh, videos and photos are on Instagram mm-hmm. um, at Brian Beacock. And then if you want really, really crazy, funny, uh, bizarre anime and animation and voiceover videos, that's at TikTok at Monokuma Brian B. Oh, that's great. Now, before we go, I, I, I have to hit on this one subject. You went a different route. Um, you got to tour with Les Miserables. Um, yeah. Which is a definitely different 
route that you took from voice acting and created these, uh, you know, dark comedy skits. Tell me about your experience <laughs> on Les Miserables, because that's a whole nother chain right there. It is. It's funny. So when I when I was growing up, I, I basically want to I want to do a lot of theater. I've been doing theater since I was seven. Mm -hmm. um, I ultimately want to do TV and film. But I was 22 or 23 and Les Mis came to town in the Bay Area. It was coming to San Francisco to the current theater. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned for it. I've been singing all my life, but never in the world did I think I would get cast um, three or four months later. They called. And I got the gig. So it was cool. It was a tour, but it was called a sit down tour. So they stayed at the current theater for a year and a half. So I moved to San Francisco. I was 23 years old. I was making all this money. Um, I played Babet, who was one of Tenardier's, you know, master of the house, one of Tenardier's gang members. I actually played about 23 different characters. So I spent more time backstage changing clothes than I ever did on stage. Um, but that it completely changed my life. So because of Les Mis, I got to buy into the uh, theater or the stage union. Yeah. And through that, I got to get my SAG card, which got me TV and film. Mm -hmm. So uh, theater was first. Les Mis started my whole TV and voiceover career when I then moved to L.A. after we closed a year and a half later. Yeah. yeah. And I'm glad I, I touched base on that because I like we discussed beginning. It's that one thing that. You yeah. That could really make a difference in your career. That's why I tell people, don't give up. Some people make it in two. Nope. Some people make it in 10. Some people take 20. We know some great actors today that didn't even get seen until they're 60 years old. So, and... It's really true. Yeah. And you, and you also, you also have to kind of like enjoy, enjoy the journey. Like you may make it someday, but this is your life now. You got to enjoy what you're doing right now. This is your success currently. So yeah. that's how I try to treat it. Yeah. And I look at life like Betty White, right? She had a career that went up, up, up. Then there was a pull, then she up, up, up. And I mean, look, yeah. she was the most popular person of her age on the millennials. So you just don't know if you get a part of the right role, your career can retake off again or just continue climbing as long right. as you that attitude that there is no, no such thing as, as not going higher and higher in your career. Right. Right, all over the place. So you have a lot of great, <laughs> which is great. I yep. think it's awesome. But um, Brian, man, it was such a great, great, great time to talk to you today. Uh, you have a lot of great energy, and uh, I look forward. To Thanks, man. Stuff. I look forward to watching more of your shows, and I'm sure my audience would love to see a lot more of the stuff you have coming out as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This was really fun. Yeah, pleasure, man. Listen, have a great night, and we're gonna talk soon. And enjoy New York City behind me, man. <laughs> <laughs> you as well. So, Brian, thank you again for being a guest on FaceTime with Todd Warden. It was such a pleasure to interview with you tonight. And everybody, please, please check out on YouTube, The Acting Dead and The Cracking Rod. Uh, two great shows, two funny shows, and I think we all need a little laughter right now in our lives. And until then, guys, please be safe, stay warm in the winter, and if not living a passionate life, then whose life are you living? Take care, everyone. I'll see you soon. He is the most interesting man in the world. I'm not always on YouTube, but when I am, I make sure I'm subscribed to FaceTime with Todd Warner. Be thirsty, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>